Hi everyone, my name is Sarah. I go by pushing up roses on the internet. I do videos here on YouTube, mostly on popular culture, sprinkled in with some activism about mental health, and I'm also a professional artist. Pretty great intro, huh? I bet you're thinking, wow, this weirdo really has her shit together, to which I throw my head back and laugh and say, she yeah, all right, in classic Wayne Campbell fashion. For the majority of my life, beginning in childhood, I've been managing a mental illness called body dysmorphic disorder, or BDD, an illness created by Satan himself as a way to torture people. <laughs> I'm joking. Maybe. It feels like hell. Here is a definition of BDD from the Mayo Clinic website. A mental illness involving obsessive focus on a perceived flaw in appearance. That flaw may be minor or imagined, but the person may spend hours a day trying to fix it. The person may try many cosmetic procedures or exercise to excess. People with this disorder may frequently examine their appearance in a mirror, constantly compare their appearance with that of others, and avoid social situations or photos. Treatment may include counseling and antidepressant medication. And another excerpt from an eating disorder website. If left untreated or unaddressed, body dysmorphic disorder can lead to serious consequences, including suicidal ideations and attempts, increased anxiety and depression, and eating disorders. Body dysmorphic disorder can cause a severe impairment in overall quality of life, making daily activities difficult. I don't want to spend too much time defining BDD because I find with this particular illness, it's easier to understand when you just see it in action. It's not easy to tell someone that you have a mental disorder that focuses on your appearance, even if it's more about perception than how you actually look. I could look totally different and still perceive myself the same way. Over the years of trying to explain BDD to people, I've gotten a myriad of responses akin to, you look great, don't worry about it, to, you're just fishing for compliments, to which I say, Oh, you sweet, sweet summer child. It should also be noted that like other mental illnesses, it manifests differently in different people. Some people focus on one specific part of their body, some people focus on their weight only, muscle mass, etc. But regardless of those differences, the symptoms will all be under the same BDD umbrella. So while I did want to prompt you with the technical definitions of BDD, I think just telling you how it developed for me by sharing diary entries and school projects will be a lot more helpful and understandable. I really wanted to put this together because despite this being a fairly common mental illness, it's one that carries the most shame for people. It's secretive, misunderstood, embarrassing to talk about, and for many people, it does go unchecked. I realized what I was dealing with when I happened to see a forum post talking about it. Now I want to be that for someone else. For the people who know something's wrong, but don't know what to call it, and for those who are currently suffering and think there isn't hope. There is hope because I am here on YouTube as a public figure with BDD. It's difficult, but it's not impossible, and that is the one thing I hope you take away from this video. Nothing is impossible. I want to warn you that I read my childhood to late teenage diary entries in here, and while some of them are entertainingly cringy, like most childhood diaries, the majority are very hard to read, so this is a heads up. It gets dark, I talk about suicide, I say disparaging things about my appearance and I talk about bulimia. I do think you should hear them out though because if you are a parent or a teacher, these are the things you need to look for. I will not be censoring any of these entries. I might crack a joke about some things for a quick cleanse, but I'm going to be as direct as possible and read the entries as they were written. Up until about 10 years old, I was a pretty normal child. I liked art, obviously. I liked music, spending time with my dad. I wanted to be a basketball player because I grew up when Michael Jordan was taking over Chicago. The usual shit. After I hit puberty, I started to become what I describe as hyper aware of my appearance. It didn't matter much before, but suddenly when my fifth grade pictures came back, it mattered. I fixated on my picture, not recognizing myself, wondering why I looked so horrible. I remember thinking I looked disgusting, chubby, with frizzy hair and bushy eyebrows. This started in me one of the most common symptoms of BDD, and that is staring at the mirror for long periods of time. I would analyze every pore, every strand of hair, every eyelash. Anytime I took a bathroom break at school, I was in front of that mirror. My appearance started to weigh heavily on my mind, and this was the beginning of a lot of absences, dipping gray and depression. I went into sixth grade unsure of myself, but because I shared a classroom with my best friend, that took some of the strain off. A few years ago, I did a video where I looked through some of my school projects from sixth grade, and while some of them were hilarious, here's a page of me talking about wanting to be Jules Verne's assistant and getting him breakfast from McDonald's, there were a few scattered in that should have been red flags. This was a long-term project called A to Z, All About Me, where a word was chosen from the alphabet and assigned a question. X was for Xerox. The question read, if you could make a copy of yourself and have some minor changes, what would you add and what would you subtract? I wrote, 
If I could make a copy of myself and make some changes, here are the changes I would make. First, I would take out some of my eyebrows because I think they are too bushy. Next, I would add on some eyelashes because they make people look much prettier. Also, I would make my hair darker, but not too much. Then I would make my hair shorter, but curlier at the same time. That is what I would change if I could make a copy of myself. So reading this back, I'm trying to understand how a teacher might just let this go. Girls are under a lot of pressure about their looks. Maybe this just reads as insecurity, but that's not how I interpret this at all. What 11-year-old specifically says she has too many eyebrows or claims people look prettier with heavy lashes? The entry is solely about my appearance and nothing else. However, at the time I was writing this, it did seem normal. I thought every girl wanted to be beautiful, that beauty equals happiness. So for me, this was not a cry for help. I really thought there wasn't anything weird about wanting to change my appearance so severely. I'm just not sure how my teacher let it go and I do wonder what he thought about it at the time. I don't have many school projects left, but I know there were more because later on in junior high, I had written something really disparaging on my homework that prompted my parents to take me to a therapist after it alarmed one of the teachers. 11 year olds should not be picking apart their appearance like that. They shouldn't be staring into mirrors or fixating so much on how they look that it hinders their life. I started a diary around fifth grade. I was about 10 or 11 years old. And the entries varied from my elementary school crushes, excitement over my summer trips to my aunt's lake house in Oklahoma, hanging out with my friends. For a while, the diary was very normal. However, after I got back those school pictures, it started to get alarming. I wrote in my diary on July 2nd, 1997. P.S. Dear Journal, sometimes I really can't take the world. Sometimes I just want to kill myself. Maybe I will. Being weird isn't all good. I sometimes hate life. Well, goodbye. When I saw this in my diary, I was shocked because prior to this entry, they were mostly lighthearted. I don't know what sparked this entry or what I was feeling at the time, but I'm certain it had to do with the fixation I had developed on my appearance. And this fixation lasted for years. The next entry that stood out was almost a year later, the summer before eighth grade. I wrote, Today, nothing much happened. I thought a lot about life and about myself. I need to lose weight and get a haircut. So I decided to go on a diet pill called Dexatrim. Oh my god, do you guys remember that? Do you remember that scam? I hope to god it will help me lose weight. I swear I know I can be pretty if I just lose some weight. So I'm horrified reading this. Um, now that I'm older and looking at this through a different lens, it doesn't even feel like I'm reading my own entries. It feels like this is someone else's diary. I want to go back and just hug this little girl who wants to go on a diet pill, who is praying to lose weight, and who thinks beauty can be attained by weight loss. I know I can be pretty if I just lose weight is a sentence I've repeated over and over again. I didn't think that I would just be thin, mind you. I thought my entire face would change if I lost weight. I would watch weight loss ads and see those fake pictures side-by-sides and before and afters of women who lost weight and look totally different afterwards, not understanding as a 12-year-old how fraudulent and dangerous the weight loss industry was and is. In reality, with BDD, it wouldn't have mattered what I looked like or how much I weighed because it was my perception that was off, not my appearance. I just did not realize that as a kid. I'm going to read the next few entries in succession and then talk about them. The rest of the entries are after I graduated from eighth grade. And at this point, I was writing a lot more often and I became almost relentless with my thoughts. They became very dark and very upsetting. Wow, I haven't written for a long time. I still like redacted because I do use real names and I, d <laughs> I don't know, just in case my crush is listening, I'm just gonna not mention his name. But yes, I did have a very, very serious crush on a, a boy with a bowl cut, uh, a bowl cut haircut. It was, it was very cute. I just graduated from eighth grade. I'm still overweight and nervous about going to high school. I pray, but nobody listens. I really want to die. This was taken from an entry just a few days later on 6 12 99. That is why I want to kill myself, because I'm not enjoying myself anymore. I wish I could be young forever, I really do, just to be a kid again. I wish I was thin, then I could really love myself. Maybe I should move to another subject. I still like Bull Cut Boy, even though I haven't seen him this summer yet. When I'm thin, I think I might ask him out. This was taken just a few days later on the 15th. P.S. I'm feeling alone, very alone. This was the very next day on 6 16 99. Man, the summer is going by really fast. I gotta lose weight or I will kill myself. I was so bored today. I feel so alone. I hate it. 
I wish my best friend was here, but she's in the Philippines. I'm not sure, but I don't think I'm going to Oklahoma this year. But I wish I was. So bye. It was clear that during this time I was becoming more and more fixated on my weight, more depressed, and very anxious about entering high school. The weird thing about reading these entries is that they will turn so dark right in the middle of an otherwise normal entry. I could go from talking about my crush or missing my best friend to just wanting to end my own life. I think it shows that I was still a kid. I still had all of these teenage girl thoughts and feelings. I was just also carrying this really heavy thing that I didn't feel I could tell anyone about. One of the biggest symptoms of BDD is not finding worth in yourself for who you actually are. Your brain convinces you that you can't love yourself unless you are some unrealistic form of beautiful. And that sentiment I wrote in one of those entries would come back all throughout my life, wanting to be thin or pretty so I could love myself. There were times when I would try to talk to a parent or an authority figure about how I was feeling in regards to my appearance. I would tell my parents that I felt ugly or fat or that I wanted to diet or go on diet pills. And unfortunately, it was never taken seriously, at least not mental illness seriously. I would always get the same response. You aren't ugly, don't worry about it. You look beautiful. People would try to fix my emotions with compliments or just write it off as common insecurities because, hey, we all have insecurities, don't we? But contrary to popular belief, vanity is not a result of BDD. I knew that compliments were meant to be a positive thing, but I took them all in as lies or niceties. There were no words that could help what I was feeling. And I would love it if words could fix mental illnesses, though. I mean, imagine telling a person suffering from depression that they're actually happy and it worked. Look at it that way. You wouldn't tell a person suffering from chronic depression that they're just a little sad. So don't tell people with BDD that they're just a little insecure. I got tired of my problems being shooed away with compliments, so I gave up on telling people and instead just wrote it all in my diary where I could say it and have it be valid, uncontested by the well-intentioned adults that just didn't pick up on all the red flags. The diary continues throughout June. 6 I got my makeover today, but I still looked ugly. My dad had to go to the hospital today. He had a stroke at work. I hope he will be okay. Well, got to go. And then the next day, 6 I hate myself. I am still on my diet and it is very hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to lose weight quick or I don't know if I can keep doing this. 6 I hate my life and I just, I can't believe I started out just with the I hate. I went from the previous entry to I hate myself and then I hate my life just right into it. No normal entry, no childhood crushes or talk about vacations, just... I hate my life. I quit my diet. I got sick from not eating. I hate myself. Why can't Jesus help me? I'm ugly and fat. This is the beginning of my father's diagnosis with cancer, and of course it's not a coincidence that my issues got worse as he got sicker. In the 622 entry, I mention a makeover. My mom thought I was just suffering from some insecurities or maybe I just had some low self-esteem and that maybe a fun makeover at the mall and some uplifting pep talks would help. She really meant well. I know she just wanted to make me feel more confident. Unfortunately, I do remember that day and I was a nervous wreck the whole time, not wanting to look into the mirror. I specifically remembered going to my aunt's house afterwards and she complimented the makeover saying how nice I looked. And I remember feeling this sharp pang, this immediate incredulous feeling. And even though I thanked her, I filed that away as a lie. People with BDD, myself included, have a very hard time accepting compliments as truth. Since what I'm seeing is disgusting, how could I possibly believe a compliment? In my brain, it's so absurd. Over time, I've gotten better at accepting compliments, but it took a long time and a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, which I will discuss more later. There's also a lot of entries where I say I prayed to be beautiful, and that's because I was raised Catholic. I do not practice any kind of organized religion these days, but as a kid, I went to Sunday school, sometimes church. It wasn't a particularly strong upbringing. I would say it was less problematic than other people's experiences in the Catholic church, but I did still pray, hopeful that somebody could help me since I felt like the adults in my life couldn't. 6-27-99 a couple days ago, I found out that my dad's lung cancer tumor spread to his brain. Sometimes he doesn't talk right or act right, and I don't know how to act now. I hope he doesn't die. I don't know if I want to go to Oklahoma this year. I'm still fat, and I wish I were dead. 6 I hate myself. Today, I went to my friend's house and played on the computer. I asked my mom if dad was going to die, and she said she hopes not. I was crushed. 
My friend is going to go to Richard's with me, and so is my best friend, but I'm nervous because I'm so fat. I'm going to Oklahoma on 714. 722 99. I can't believe summer is going by so quickly. July is almost over, and I haven't lost any weight, but I think I will soon. See you later. This was the last entry in this diary. My dad did pass away in January of 2000 during my freshman year of high school. Because of that, high school was an absolute mess, just a total shit show. I had an overdose the following year when I was 15. I refused to go to school the majority of the time, which resulted in me being moved to an alternative school for sophomore year. After that, I had a suicide attempt where I overdosed on some antidepressants and eventually dropped out of high school altogether. After dad passed, I started treatment with a therapist and a psychiatrist for depression. Throughout all of this, my appearance was still what gave me the most grief, but I still felt too embarrassed to admit that, and having depression made sense. I did have depression. I was in a very dark place after dad died, and that's why I had the antidepressants on hand. I did have a brief amount of time where I felt relieved, and that came soon after I dropped out. The pressure from school and teachers were getting to me. I felt anxious all the time. Honestly, dropping out was one of the best decisions I made at the time, and I stand by it. I started taking GED classes not long after because despite how I felt about myself, I still wanted to go to college, study art, date, anything to have a normal life. Therapy was only so effective because I wasn't actually being treated for BDD. It was good to be able to talk about depression and grief, but the longer the BDD went unchecked, the harder it became to get better. The stress led to a binge eating disorder. The next journal I found was started in May of 2002. I found an entry where I was talking about overeating to the point of being sick. I wrote, I want to lose weight, but I find the only way I can do it is by purging. I don't do it all the time anyway. So this is when I became bulimic. It actually hurts me to read this because so many addiction-related illnesses start this way. You justify your actions by saying you won't do it all the time. You'll just do it when you need a quick fix or a little guilt relief. I'd become so certain that losing weight was the answer to all my problems and I could be beautiful then. I do want to include a few lighthearted entries because, again, I was still doing normal things. I was still functioning on some level at this point. I thought this one was pertinent. Law & Order has been one of my favorite shows for a while now. I'm watching it right now. Good news, I passed my GED test. I was so nervous, I almost didn't want to take it, but I'm glad my mom persuaded me to go. I plan to go to college in January. I think sharing this entry is important because it shows I was still motivated. I wasn't lazy or undetermined. I really still wanted a good future for myself. Here's another that made me laugh. I hope this pen works. Good. I'm writing this from the bathtub. I hope I don't drop the book. <laughs> Little scribblies. Spoiler, I dropped the book. Okay, I decided the bathtub and the journal thing wasn't going to fly. Oh well. Here's an entry from October 3rd, 2005, and this was about three years of bulimia. Sometimes I truly think I am insane. Other times I seem happy. The truth is, I don't feel normal anymore. I feel like my life is all messed up and it's my fault. I know my dad's death isn't my fault, but did I have to go and drop out of school because of it? And I don't know why I'm doing this. I think this just kind of proves where my mind was at, but I am referring to dropping out of high school. At this point, I'm already in college. I've already moved on. So I'm obviously beating myself up and reflecting on things that I did that I didn't think was normal to do. It wasn't society standard normal. Why couldn't I cope better? Why am I such a freak? Sometimes I think I would be happier if I was prettier. Recently, I hate my appearance. I have a big nose and dark skin under my eyes, making me look sick and ugly. I'm normally paranoid about my looks, and sometimes I don't even want to go out because of it. I wish I didn't care so much. I wish I could get a nose job or brighten the skin under my eyes, but I can't. My boyfriend thinks I'm beautiful, but I don't see it. How can he possibly think that? I am living simply to live, without purpose or happiness. This was the last diary entry I ever wrote. I had been bulimic for about three years, and this is important. You can clearly see my fixation has shifted to my face. By this time, I dropped a significant amount of weight, around 100 pounds. Even after I lost the weight I had claimed I wanted to, I found myself unhappy, exhausted. I still was not seeing myself accurately. After I lost the weight, my focus went to my face, which had not changed like I thought it would. That is why things like plastic surgery are not recommended for people with BDD, because it really is about perception. People suffering commonly go overboard, attempting to fix either minor issues or issues that are not even there to make themselves happy, but in reality, it makes them feel worse. BDD is considered to be in the same spectrum as OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. A lot of the symptoms overlap. I'll get a lot of intrusive thoughts, but also be completely preoccupied with my face. I would spend 
hours in front of the mirror, scrutinizing every part of my skin, picking and pulling at my cheeks, taking selfies at different angles, and deeming myself ugly depending on how well the picture turned out. I would brush my hair obsessively, even if there was nothing wrong with it. A lot of my day was frankly wasted by this preoccupation. If it wasn't one thing, it was another. The moment I would find something I liked about myself, my brain would find something else to be unhappy about. At one point, I had a list of cosmetic procedures I wanted to save up for, and once I had those, I would be happy. But thank fuck I didn't go down that route because it would have been expensive and ultimately unhelpful for me. There have been many celebrities who have come forward to talk about their experiences with BDD, including Shirley Manson, Robert Pattinson, Billie Eilish, and Reed Ewing. Ewing's discussion really resonated with me. He's actually been very, very candid and open with his struggles, so I would like to share some of that with you. Reed Ewing, the actor from Modern Family, has been open about having suffered from BDD for years. He has undergone many cosmetic surgeries, but has never been satisfied with the results. When he first moved to LA, he admitted that all he wanted to do was sit in his apartment and take photos of himself from every angle. His first surgery was at age 19 for a cheek implantation that he describes as leaving his cheeks, quote, as hollow as a corpse's. He then had multiple surgeries to fix the problems that he believed the initial surgeries had caused. He now believes the surgeries were unethical and ineffective. He said, I genuinely believed that if I had one operation, I would suddenly look like Brad Pitt. Here's a diary entry written by author Franz Kafka that also portrays really strong symptoms of BDD. He wrote, I didn't want any new clothes at all because if I had to look ugly anyway, I wanted to at least be comfortable. I let the awful clothes affect even my posture, walked around with my back bowed, my shoulders drooping, my hands and arms all over the place. I was afraid of mirrors because they showed an inescapable ugliness. I just want to quickly say that I am not against cosmetic surgery in general, it's just not an effective treatment for people with BDD, and not only is it ineffective, it can sometimes make their perceptions worse, just as Ewing described. Even though my attention was focused on my face, I was so deep into the bulimia that I couldn't stop. I became paranoid that if I stopped purging or ate too much, I would balloon up. I believed with every fiber of my being that I could see the fat growing on me after dinner. Like that's how severe it was. I would eat dinner and then minutes later, I would think I was seeing that back in the mirror and I would have to get rid of it to feel better to get rid of any fat that I could see on my body. After a few years passed, I went into an inpatient program where I was treated essentially for addiction. I know that when we think about addiction, we think about things like drugs, alcohol, but my behavior with the looping binge, purge, and starve cycle that I couldn't stop had the same traits as an addiction. I would get the same adrenaline I wanted, the relief, and then the crash and burn soon after. And I just want to firmly say here that this cycle is not worth it. Do not tell yourself you'll only purge until you're thin or you can stop whenever you want or it won't be a big deal. It is not worth it. It will fuck with your head, your teeth, your hair, your skin. It causes hallucinations and delusional thinking. It is not worth it. If you are on the edge thinking about going to extremes to lose weight, I am here to tell you that it will not make you happy. Ask yourself, why the pain? Why am I in pain? Why am I feeling this way? And get help before you choose a path like this. There were a lot of suicide attempts during this time because I didn't know what to do. I couldn't live with myself believing that I was not just ugly, but disgusting. And I couldn't keep purging either. I was put on psychiatric meds, but they weren't fully able to do their job because I would randomly purge. And for anyone who's familiar with being on psych meds, you know you can't be willy-nilly with them. Basically, I was unstable as fuck. Eating disorders and malnourishment like that changes your brain chemistry. I wasn't lying in that last diary entry where I said, I feel like I'm losing my mind. I think I was. I would lie to my loved ones at the drop of a hat, too embarrassed to talk about what was actually causing me pain. So I'd make up excuses like, oh, I just have the flu. I'm just not feeling well. It's fine. There were a few times I was actually caught throwing up by a family member or a few of my close friends. They knew without a doubt what I was doing and I still lied straight to their faces. I remember watching my best friend's face just melt into this disappointed, heartbroken look because she knew I just flat out lied to her, denied having an issue. From my early to mid-20s, I would describe myself as a very toxic person. I was out of control, I was mean to people, I was a compulsive liar, paranoid all the time. I liked seeing other people miserable because I was so miserable. And I want to reiterate something that Emily Artful said in one of her recent videos, 
And that is, there's no such thing as an unproblematic fave. We're all problematic because we're human. My relationships were impaired. On top of that, I developed another addiction to prescription painkillers because they were the only things that made me fall asleep. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know how to fix it. I was miserable and refused to take any responsibility for my behaviors because I just didn't give a shit. I looked into the mirror and saw this melting blob. And that's the thing with BDD. You don't just find yourself, quote, unattractive. It's more severe than that. I often describe myself as gross, disgusting, abnormal, so abnormal that you don't give a shit about yourself anymore and that's where I was. I refused to examine any problematic behavior because I thought I was a lost cause anyway. And before I continue, I want to say that no matter how toxic behavior manifests, whether it's assigned to your mental state or just you being a shithead of a person, the answer is going to be therapeutic. Therapy and psychiatric help is for everyone. It's not just for the mentally ill or people in rocky relationships. It's for anyone who wants to change their behavior. So this cycle of terrible behavior took a hard turn when I had one last overdose in my mid-20s. I had come so close to death that it forced me to take a long look into the mirror and figure out what the fuck was going on with me. The first step was going back into inpatient and getting regular help from a therapist so I could recover from bulimia. Then I would try to get a job, go back to school, anything to fix this broken fucking shell of a person I'd become. I did end up recovering from bulimia, though it took many years and went into my late 20s. I went back to school, I got a job, and I started a YouTube channel as a hobby. I apologized where I could, I tried to salvage some relationships with people I had hurt and others I had to let go. And it hurt, but I had to be real with myself. Not everyone was going to forgive and forget. And I couldn't look backwards, I had to keep looking forward. Even though I started to recover from bulimia and was being treated for depression, I still hadn't gotten to the root of everything. I was still not talking about how I felt about my appearance or the obsessive compulsive symptoms I was experiencing because it just felt too embarrassing. It felt like I had a made up issue, like something I could just wish away on my own. Like I said earlier, anytime I tried to open up, I felt invalidated because people would respond with compliments and it made me feel crazy. One day, just randomly, I was on an acne forum, and keep in mind, I didn't have acne. BDD was causing me to feel like I had blemishes on my face, so I would scour acne forums for answers, and I found a thread that mentioned body dysmorphic disorder. Another woman had been posting pics of herself, claiming her face was ugly, distorted, marred by acne, but the photos of herself were beautiful. A lot of people responded hostily, saying she was attention-seeking, fishing for compliments, all of that lovely stuff that really encourages people, to be honest. But then I found one person intervene, demanding people back off this woman because she clearly had some body dysmorphia that affects how she sees her face. I had never even seen the words body dysmorphic disorder before. So that led me to looking it up, and it made sense. Everything. Every symptom. Every behavior. It sounded like me. What I was dealing with had a name. In my late 20s, I was diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder. And at first, I wasn't sure if it made me feel better or not. Even with the diagnosis, I still felt ashamed or hesitant to be open about it with my friends and family. BDD is one of those illnesses people have trouble accepting. You'll hear me and others say, no, I don't have BDD, I'm just ugly. It was hard to veer away from my obsession with my looks or even admit to myself that maybe I just wasn't seeing myself correctly. The notion was crazy to me. Like, what do you mean I have an illness that makes me think I'm ugly? That sounds made up. I have two eyes, I can see I'm ugly, and the answer to my issues is getting pretty. At one point, I thought maybe it was both. Maybe I had BDD and I was ugly at the same time, which, if you've been paying attention, will sound utterly bonkers to you. That's just not how it works, and that's why it's hard to catch and diagnose. If you think you're both, it's BDD more often than not. If you see something about yourself that no one else sees, it's BDD more often than not. If you cannot stand to look at yourself in the mirror, if you think you look different in certain lighting or in pictures, it's BDD more often than not. I would say that even today, I don't truly know what I look like. I know I have badass tattoos. I know that I like my personal style. I know that I have two eyes and a mouth and all that. But even today, when I snap a selfie, sometimes I won't think it actually looks like me. One of the hardest things has been photos. Selfies I worked up to and I'm proud of my efforts. Many years ago, I couldn't bear to even take one because seeing the result would send me into an obsessive spiral, sometimes triggering suicide ideas. Radiation. Today, I'm able to take them and post them online. Having my photo taken by other people has never really gotten better. 
I am so terrified of the result that I actually get panicked when I see somebody using their phone camera. It hasn't always been this severe, but you can imagine how difficult it would have been having an undiagnosed illness that warps how you see yourself growing up with every evolving technology. You know, when I was young, it was rare people had a camera on them, and now everyone has one right on their phone. I had to learn to be very honest and candid with my friends about how I feel about taking pictures, and for the most part, they were and are very understanding. It's not worth ruining my entire night just for one shit picture at a bar, and they know that. I've had negative experiences too, people who just flat out ignore my request, who try to convince me that they'll take the best picture, or they simply reply to my concerns with, oh come on now, you know you're pretty. <coughs> uh, no. I don't know shit. That's part of the problem. That's what BDD is. And just in general, I don't like anyone that uses you know you are in a sentence. You know. You know, you Lena. You know that. Lena, no, you, shh. you know you that. You know that. To people who don't fully understand, I say, you don't need to understand it. I just need you to respect it. When I started my YouTube channel and got some popularity, I really struggled with my appearance again. However, I was determined. I wanted to make videos. I wanted to make people laugh. And there was no way I was not going to find a way to do that. I am a stubborn ass bitch. And once I decide to do something, that's it. It's going to get done. Being on camera was torture, so I have no idea why I thought being a YouTuber would totally be the best idea. But as I went through treatment and started doing exposures, it got better. I spent many a night crying hysterically over my own footage, but the more I did it, the better it got. Exposure therapy is exactly what it sounds like. It's doing things to confront your illness head on, exposing yourself. Whoa, no, that is terrible phrasing. Don't expose yourself. That's not what that is. It's more like making yourself visible to yourself, looking in the mirror, taking photos and not deleting them, practice being on camera. This was a painfully slow process, but I've been better at taking selfies and essentially getting used to how I look. But even more than that, my therapy has been helping me put emphasis on other things, reframing my own worth and celebrating my accomplishments. I managed to make a YouTube channel. I managed to make a business out of my art. I should celebrate those things because they make me who I am, no matter what I look like. And trust and believe that is easier said than done. There's no way I would have done this when I was actually in the throes of bulimia. I'd respond to it with something like, shove it with your positive affirmations, you flowery freak. Wow, that's hard to say. Fla flow flowery freak. Flowery freak. <laughs> but my persistence worked and I really was able to get better. I went from hiding in the dark in my room, hoping no one would see, to actually being an online presence. I mean, I'm now terminally online, so I really got to reel that in, but at least I'm not hiding or putting all of my worth into my appearance. As I went through therapy, the way I talked about myself changed. I started to tell my therapist how proud I was of my channel or of my art or any project I had going on. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think I'm beautiful because that wouldn't be true and it's, it's really not how it works. There's a lot of distorted thinking and flawed visual processing with BDD. And even though I'm being treated, I still trip up, I have bad days, or my obsessive compulsive symptoms like checking the mirror every five seconds flare up. Compliments are still hard. But I have fully accepted that this is what I'm dealing with. And even though there's no cure, it can be lifelong, I can at least manage it. What I can say is that I'm in control, I'm healing, and I have beauty. I took back some of my power over my body and how I feel about it by decorating it with badass tattoos, gothy jewelry, and fun Elton John glasses. I may not feel beautiful, but I do have beauty, if that makes sense. Not every day is a winner, but at least I could look at myself and say I came out sort of nearish the top, sort of. Man, I'll take being in the middle over being on the bottom again. There's nothing down there, I assure you. Just a bunch of rotten shit and piss and probably copies of E.T. for the Atari or something. I know this video is a lot to take in, but I do hope it helps someone, even just one goddamn person who is suffering from BDD and doesn't realize there's help for it. I hope this video gives you an idea of what to look for in terms of symptoms and behavior. This is a real illness, an under-discussed illness that people are ashamed to talk about, but if you don't, things will not get better. I wish it didn't take so long for me to get diagnosed and really be honest about how I felt. I wish the teachers had noticed my weird quips about my appearance, and I wish I had talked to someone about my suicide ideation instead of keeping it private in my diary. I wish I hadn't been so horrible to my loved ones, but even though all these things happened, I was still able to find some help so I could live my life a little more comfortably and with hope. 
I don't want to and can't be held down by the pain of my past. It's a nice place to visit, but I can't fucking live there. I have to stay focused and keep building myself back up. And now let me be totally transparent and candid in saying that yes, I monetize this video because I put in the fucking work for this beast. I'm not profiting on someone else's pain. I'm profiting off of my pain, goddammit. However, I will be donating half the proceeds from this video to the BDD Foundation. And if you want, you can also go to the website and donate on your own terms. I wanna thank you for listening and I wish you all the best on your mental health journeys. Remember, you are in control, you are healing, and you have beauty.